So as many of you know, and, and I, I think like maybe the three of you that aren't currently on a keto diet um, know that pretty much the whole church now is on a keto diet. I think maybe Barbie started it and then Teresa got on board and anyway, it spread like a virus. At one point, the entire office staff was on a low, keto by the way is low carb, high fat, was on this keto diet, but ultimately Sherry and Dennis couldn't hang and they abandoned wagon. So yeah, I'm calling you out. All right. <laughs> But anyway, our, low car, our, our keto diet is a low-carb, high-fat, so that means we eat a lot of meats, a lot of bacon, because bacon is a category all its own, a lot of cheese, a lot of butter. Like, that is the staples of our diet, and I'm completely okay with. But, yeah, those things are amazing. I can eat as much bacon as my body can hold, okay? What kind of diet does that? Now, with that said, there are things we cannot eat. For instance, we can't have... Uh, breads. We cannot have sugars. We cannot have most grains. Uh, we cannot have potatoes. And who knows, regardless of what your diet is, anytime you limit yourself or you on a diet or you say you cannot have this one thing, what do you want more than anything? That one thing. I, you can go on a cupcake diet and you will crave celery. I don't know why this happens. Okay? No matter what you can have, you always want that thing that you cannot have. Right? So Jessica and I, we've been on this diet for a while, and we've had two different cravings. There's several things we can't have. And she's been craving bread. Um, she wants, like, cornbread and biscuits and rolls. And she's been craving that. And I'm kind of okay without that. Um, but I've been craving, well, fried taters, one, but that's not what I'm talking about today. But I've been craving sugars. I just want cake and ice cream and all these things I didn't really want before. Now I'm craving like crazy. So I'm going to tell you a story. Something happened to us. So I was in the kitchen. I'll give you a little backstory first. So we used to have this brownie recipe, this homemade brownie recipe that we had, we had it up on the fridge and it was six ingredients. It was super simple, but it was amazing. We would make these brownies pretty much weekly, which probably attributed to the need for the diet. But we would make this recipe almost weekly, and uh, we apparently just love brownies. Um, so one day, I was in the kitchen while on my keto diet. And you ever have those sprees where you go in your kitchen, you just open every door and just grunt because there's nothing there? And all you're doing is just complaining because you have nothing to eat? You're not actually looking for anything. You're just complaining that there's no food in your house, right? So one day, I was doing that, and I go to open up the fridge, and I see out of the corner of my eye that brownie recipe that, for some unknown reason, we didn't take down. And I see that brownie and instantly hot, fresh brownies flash in my brain. And I see two ingredients. The only two ingredients I see out of the corner of my eye are eggs and sugar. And this sparked this idea in my brain. I can have, did I say sugar? I meant butter. Eggs and butter. I was like, I can have eggs and butter. And then I begin to look at the other ingredients. There's only six ingredients. Surely I can make this happen. I believe in myself. I can have eggs and butter. I, dis I discover I can have cocoa powder, not a problem. I can have baking powder, not a problem. So there's only two ingredients left. Sugar isn't really a problem because I always substitute sugar for Splenda, so that's easy. Now the tricky one comes, flour. How am I gonna make this work? You cannot have flour. So I decide I have almond flour. It's almost the same thing. This will work. I believe in myself. I've solved the puzzle. All keto -er, ketoers worldwide are going to love me for this. I'm going to sell this recipe on eBay. Okay, so I decide I'm going to sub out the flour for almond flour, and I make this thing, and, and I put all these ingredients in my bowl, and I whip it up, and I've got to admit, it is dark, and it is creamy, and it looks like brownie mix. It looks good. It smells good. So I'm getting excited at this point, right? So I put it in my brownie tin, and I throw it in the oven for the allotted amount of time. I you go do something. I come back, and the kitchen smells like brownies. Oh, it smelled so good. I walked in there, and it just, you know, you know, you know when a smell hits you, and you just get excited from the smell of it? So that smell hits me, and it just smells like brownies. And I pull the brownies out, and they've risen perfectly. They look like they could be on the cover of a magazine. These brownies look so good. So I decide, Jessica and I, we are going to share, we are going to rejoice in this moment together, okay? I'm not even going to eat any without her. So I, I cut a, each a brownie, I put them on a saucer, I get me some coffee, I get her something to drink, and I take them to her, and, and they smell so good, and they're flaky, and they look great, and they smell great. 
and we cut into it with our fork, and it's steaming. You know those brownies are gooey and steamy, and, and we lift it up, and we put that fork in our mouth, and, and they smelled so good, and they looked so good. They tasted like absolute dirt. <laughs> they were awful. I don't, I don't know what went wrong. I had five of the six ingredients. I didn't know flour was that important. But apparently you take flour out and you just have garbage because we threw that away. That was disgusting. So those of you that are writing down that recipe, just mark it out. You don't want to do it. Try something else. Try something else. All right. But who knows that when we're making a recipe, there is usually one key ingredient that you cannot remove from the mix. For instance, we had some friends over one time. Uh, it was a couple and, and the, the husband was going to the kitchen to make brownies. We clearly have a problem. Okay. So he was going to make some brownies, not homemade brownies, but he was making instant brownies. It calls for two ingredients, water and eggs. He leaves out the water. Can we guess what happens to these brownies? Well, they're more like a rock at this point when we pull them out of the oven. So missing one ingredient can completely mess up a recipe, right? Now, I want to say that our lives follow a similar route. That there is a recipe and there is a recipe book for our lives. However, if we miss one key ingredient, it can ruin the entire dish, right? We can have everything else we need. We can have five of the six ingredients. We can have everything we need in the recipe. But if we miss the one key thing, it'll completely destroy the dish. That if we have everything but the one key thing, the dish will still be ruined, that we can live a life that we acquire everything we ever wanted and everything we've ever needed, and we thought we had all the ingredients to make a perfect Christian life, but if we miss the one key ingredient, that is God, then our life will fall short every time, that we will never be fulfilled by things of this world, because things of this world can never fill us, even though it feels like that is what we need, this thing will make me happy, I have all the necessary ingredients, but if we leave out the one key ingredient, our lives will never be filled. So I want to ask if we've ever done that in life, and I will openly admit that I have, that I have been living a good life and that I've had things that I thought I wanted. I had things that I thought would make me happy. I had things that I thought would fulfill me. However, there was still something missing. And without that key ingredient, you will always live a life that you regret. You can own everything in the entire world and die a poor man if you don't have God. And you can have nothing in the world and die a rich man or a rich woman if you have the love of God. Amen? I want to talk to you guys just a little while. I'm going to be reading in Philippians 3 if you have your Bibles with you. You can go and turn there, pull it up on your phones. I'll have it on this awesome TV too. But I'm going to be talking to you about a guy by the name of Paul. Paul was once known as Saul, and he lived a very interesting life. You see, Saul was a religious leader. He was a religious ruler. That Saul was one of the high ups. He was a Pharisee. And Saul was actually known for persecuting the church. He would go and he would hunt down Christians. He would hunt down those that say, Jesus is risen. And he would basically try them on the spot. Oftentimes they would be stoned or persecuted in that very moment. That was Saul's job. Now Saul has an encounter with Jesus and his life completely changes. That Saul meets Jesus, he gets renamed to Paul, he becomes one of the greatest teachers of first century Christianity, and he becomes well, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. This dude has a very interesting life. Now, I want to read to you what he says to the church of Philippi. While he is sitting in prison, he writes what is known as the most joyful book in the Bible while he is imprisoned. I've never been imprisoned, but I don't imagine I'd be too happy about it. But this is the guy we're going to talk about. Remember that backstory as we read this passage. By the way, my message is titled, It's All God. Did that first service too. Anyway. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. If you want to know what that means, ask Teresa next week. We rely on what Christ Jesus 
has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Paul is saying if anyone could have confidence in their own human effort, their own human achievements, it would be me. He says, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. He says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Notice what Paul says. Paul says in this moment, if there was a recipe for a perfect Jew, I fulfilled it. I had all of the correct ingredients. I had everything that it took. He said that I was circumcised on the eight, on, when I was eight days old. If you want to know the importance of that, in Genesis 17.12 it says, From generation to generation every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Paul is referencing that as far as the Jewish law goes, he has obeyed it completely. Even in the fits that he could not control, he is a perfect Jew. He says that he is a pure-blooded pure blood, pure Israelite. That through the generations, the Israelites moved from nation to nation, from captivity to captivity, and throughout this time period, the Israelites often taint the Israelite bloodline by having children with other nationalities. And that would mean that the bloodline was no longer pure, but not Paul. Paul did not fall into that. He was not a half-blood. He was a pure blood. That's who Paul was. He says, as far as perfections with Jewish law goes, I am perfect. He says that he's of the tribe of Benjamin, which is the tribe that the first king of Israel is from, the king Saul, who he's named after. Paul is saying, if you look at this scripture, he says, as far as being a Jew goes, I was perfect. He says, as far as righteousness goes, I obeyed the law without fault. This man, the man who was absolutely perfect as far as Jewish standards goes, still recognized that something was missing. Paul, as perfect as he was, as perfect as he lived, with everything he had going on, recognized that something was missing from his life, that there was a void there that had not yet been filled. And I believe you and I, every person in existence since the beginning of time, have that same void that needs to be filled. Now I'm going to break off in a different direction just for a moment. See, I I love apologetics, and if you're not familiar with apologetics, apologetics are basically defending the Christian faith using science, history, archaeology, but using naturalistic things to prove as evidence for the existence of God. Now, we obviously still need faith, but God gives us evidences of his existence and his goodness. Now, oftentimes when I'm talking to an atheist, I'll hear the same set of questions that always seem to come up, and one of them goes like this. Well, there are so many religions, there are 10 million, there are 10,000, there are so many different religions, how do you know that Christianity is the one true religion? Or another question similar to that is there are so many different religions, how do you know that there is actually a God and humans just aren't desperate for hope? And I'll give you my answers to that. I know that there is a God because there are so many different religions. That's not my reason. That is circular reasoning at its best. Let me explain. I know there is a God because there are so many different religions. You see, when, when London was smaller, she had this thing where she would want to eat rocks and she would want to eat dirt. And we were told, yeah, it's weird, but we were told that children of her age would do this because they have an iron deficiency. That, that they would want to ingest rocks and they'd want to ingest dirt to to fill that need. It's not that their brain knows the need is there. It's that their body knows there is a need and that it needs filled. It's not their brain thinking these things through. But I think the same thing is true for us as human beings, is that our soul knows there is a void inside of us that needs filled. We may not be able to mentally comprehend it, but since the beginning of time, there is a void that needs filled that can only be filled by God, right? 
That's why there are so many different religions, because each and every human being knows that there is a place in our soul that is lacking, and that there is only one thing that can fill it. And, and yes, there are false gods, and there, there are incorrect gods, but there's also poison, but that doesn't disprove the need for food, right? That since there are so many gods, that proves that there is a void in each and every human. And atheists also have a god, they just label it science, but it still takes faith to even believe in science. Because you weren't there to see everything happen. You have to take the word of someone else. And we do the same thing, but we take the word of God. So the second part of the question, if we can assume there is a God because there is a need and our soul knows the need and, and, and there's a void that must be filled, how do we know that the God of Christianity is the true God? Now, I'll tell you what did it for me because, as I'll talk about a little bit later, I grew up agnostic. I was not a believer in Jesus. But what did it for me is the historical Jesus. That how do we know that Christianity is right and all the other religions are wrong? It's because Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, can be historically proven. Did you know there are more writings about Jesus, if not God, a mere carpenter, than there are about Julius Caesar? And I'm saying extra biblical, meaning it exists outside of the Bible. I'm talking about writings that are not by Christians, they are by Jews, they are by Romans, they are by Babylonians, they are by other people of that day, people who gain nothing by the existence or resurrection of Jesus. That there are writings outside of the Bible that document and prove the existence of a historical Jesus. And most atheists will not dispute that. You cannot disprove Jesus' existence. He very clearly existed in history. So how do we go from the existence of a historical Jesus to the existence of Jesus as God? What did it for me is if we look at the followers, if we look at even at the writings of non-Christians, they will document the very things the gospels say. They'll do it in a secular way. They'll say that Jesus was a great teacher. He had a great following. He was killed under Pontius Pilate. And that his following, his followers died away for a short period of time, but then Christianity exploded more rapidly than any other movement in existence. That doesn't typically happen when the person the movement is built around dies. Other writings actually say that his followers claimed to see Jesus after he rose. Then we have 11 men who started. It would have been the, the eyewitnesses to uphold the lie. These 11 men are documented, once again, extra-biblically outside of the Bible, that they go and they are tortured and killed for their beliefs, and not once did they recant their statement that Jesus was risen. That evidence alone tells me that Jesus was real. Jesus walked, and the claims he made were real because people don't die for a lie. At least 11 men don't die for a lie. The final thing that convinced me is life change. We can see throughout the Bible, we can see throughout history, we can see through scientific documentation that one of the main forms of life change is through an encounter with Jesus Christ. We see it right here with Saul of Tarsus. He was a persecutor of the church. He was against the church. He was raised to believe that Christianity was false teaching. It was, it was blasphemy against God. Yet Saul becomes Paul after an encounter with Jesus and his life completely changes. And the final proof for me personally is I walked into this church about five years ago as an agnostic. I did not believe in God. I did not believe in the existence of God. I did not see why it mattered for my life. But God has completely flipped and changed my life upside down. And I know he is real because of what he's done in me and he's done through me and he continues to do with me. God is the God of life change. That was a long-winded response to two questions you might not have asked but I felt like it needed to be said. So to get back on topic, I believe we all have a void inside of us that needs to be filled. We all have a void that maybe, even though we have all the necessary ingredients, even though we have everything else and we have the perfect job, the perfect car, the trophy wife, we have everything else in life we think we might need, we still feel empty inside. Because regardless of all the ingredients we have, if we miss the one key ingredient, our lives will always fall short and we will never be fulfilled. 
Paul knew this. Paul, the man who just got done telling you how perfect he was, the man who just got done saying, as far as a perfect Jewish person goes, I am absolutely perfect. He still knew something was missing. Because in the very, very next verse, starting in verse 7, Paul says this. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I want us to know exactly what Paul is saying here. Paul says, in this moment, that all these things that I had strived my entire life for, that I had worked, that I had learned from the beginning of time, these things that I had worked hard for, that I thought these things, these Jewish laws, these Jewish commandments, this righteousness, following these laws, I thought they would make me happy. I thought they would fulfill me. But whenever he met the only thing that could fulfill him, he says they were all garbage. They were all trash, that it is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as your Lord. That whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever you are striving for, whatever that thing is that you thought would make you happy, and when you acquired it and it fell short, that that's okay because that was never meant to make you happy. The things of this world, these worldly treasures that we so often chase after and we so often acquire, they were never meant to fulfill us. So we should not be surprised when we have the new iPhone 10 plus and we are no longer happy with it. We should no longer be surprised when we get that promotion we've been wanting so badly at work and we are no longer happy with our job. We should not be surprised when the things of this world fail to fulfill us because they were never meant to fulfill us. God is the only thing that can fulfill us. No amount of work or deeds can do that because Jesus Christ is the only fulfillment in existence. So recently, I had a student tell me a statement that I just thought was so powerful. And maybe it's something I should have realized, something I should have known. But when they said it, they said, there is no darkness. Darkness does not actually exist. There is only the absence of light. That is what exists. Light exists and darkness only exists where there is no light. And as I was just thinking about that and I was, I was writing this message I began to realize that there are areas in my life, and I'm gonna take my previous metaphor a little bit further, that our lives are not typically like one giant brownie, okay? Our lives are much more like multiple individual recipes that we have, okay, I've taken the metaphor too far, that we have different areas of our lives. We have our marriage and we have our work life and we have our church life and we have our parenting or we have our relationship with our parents that we have multiple sections of our lives. And too often, our lives aren't necessarily like Job where Job just lost everything and his entire life failed. That, you know, Job lost his kids and he lost his riches and he lost his house and, you know, he kept his nagging wife. And, you know, like Job's entire life fell apart. And most of the time, our lives don't look like that. Most of the time, our lives look like the life of Paul or or Saul, rather. 
that we seem to have everything else put together, that we have that Instagram life, that from the outside looking in, we have it all, but we secretly know there are areas in our life that are struggling. That maybe, maybe I have a great relationship with my kids and I'm financially sound and I love my job, but my marriage is struggling. Or maybe my marriage is great and I make good money and I love my job, but something's happened with my kids and there's just a distance, there's a void there I can't get through. Or, or maybe you're having a problem with your parents and in that area of your life you just can't explain, it's not going well. Or maybe you have a great marriage and great parenting and your finances are good, but you just hate waking up and going to work every morning. That You just hate that job you keep being forced to go to. Whatever it is, our lives are divided into sections and you can have everything perfectly over here, but this over here isn't going so well. That there is darkness in that area of your life. And I felt like God kind of said to me, because this, this again is what's happening in my own life, I'm just passing it along to you, that I have areas in my life that I would consider dark. And as I thought about that statement, there is no such thing as darkness, only the absence of light. And in 1 John 1 and 5, it says God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So when I say these areas of my life are dark, am I letting God shine his light into those areas? Those areas of struggle, those areas of pain, those areas of addiction, those areas that you would consider dark and desperate, are you letting God shine his light into those areas? Are you giving that area of your life to God? And I just, I had God ask me, Jeff, are you giving that area of your life to me? Are you following my rule book on that area of your life? Or are you continually trying to handle that area the way that you think it should be handled because you think you know better than God? And I was just kind of blown away and I said, well, God, I'm sorry that I thought I could handle this situation, that I could handle this struggle, that I could handle this problem better than you. When you've given me all the answers, because every area of your life is addressed in this book, and God has already given us the solution to the problems we're going to face, the question is, are we letting God shine his light into our darkness, or will we let those areas remain dark by the absence of God? Because anywhere God is, there can be no darkness. If we let God into our darkness, he will shine light on it. So I want you guys... Once again, this was what God was saying to me. This may mean nothing to you, and that is fine. But if it meant something to you, and if you are thinking about an area of your life that you are struggling, even though everything else is perfect, you are thinking of an area of your life that could use God's light, I want you to write this down in your journal. Just write this question. Have I given my blank to God? Whatever that is for you. Have I given my marriage to God, my finances, my addiction, my struggle, my pain, my health, my circumstances? Have I given it to God? Have I turned it over to the one who has the answers? Because too often, we have areas of our lives that we think we know the right way to go. We think we have the answers, and most of the time, those are the areas of our lives we struggle in the most. So have you given that area of your life to God? I want you guys to reflect on that this week and think about that, but I'm gonna close with this. I have, I heard a song this week it's actually a Christian rap song, which is my favorite kind of music, so don't be thrown off by that. I have a clip I want you to hear, but it's just something that God said to me, and, and I could not get this phrase out of my head, and, and I feel like it will fit this situation. Just listen to this clip real quick. Where did we get off and where did it all go wrong? We stop talking Jesus as soon as the mic is off I had a dream last night, this is what I saw You can build a Christian empire without God So I don't know if you caught the final line of that song 
But he said, you can build a Christian empire without God. And that statement, that phrase stuck in my head for almost a week. And when I first heard it, I was immediately defensive because I actually like KB. He is a pastor and a preacher as well. Um, but when I first heard it, I almost thought he meant it in a different light, that he was saying he could build a Christian empire without God. But the phrase wouldn't get out of my brain. And I kept thinking about it, and I kept thinking about it, and I prayed about it. And finally, I heard God say, Jeff, are you building a Christian life without me? Are you building a Christian life without me? You see, because you can live a Christian life without God. Let me explain. That we can create a pretty good to look at from the outside looking in Christian life and completely leave God out of it. And I think this is all too current, this is all too relevant to American Christianity, that we do the Christian things. We go to church, you know, weekly or monthly, and, and, and you know, we, we'll raise our hands during worship, and we'll amen what the preacher says. And when someone's complaining about something on Facebook, we'll pray for you, brother. And we will do these Christian things, but we will live life completely without God, that when we enter into a decision, when we enter into a conversation, when we face life and we face struggles and we face troubles, we will completely leave God out of that decision making. That we will go days, weeks, months on end without ever going to the word of God. That we will go months, weeks, days without ever praying to God. But we will do the Christian things that everyone can see. And we will attend church and and we'll do all those Christian-like things, but we are living life without God. Once again, maybe this is just for me. But I felt like God was saying, Jeff, you can live a pretty Christian life, but am I a part of it? You see, and I think it's all too easy to make that mistake. You see, every year at Winter Conference, this happens. At Winter Conference, usually on the last night, we'll have a big group of students, and, and my students in here can testify to this, that it'll be the last night of Winter Conference, and we're usually in a large group, and usually someone is crying, and the statement comes out, I don't want to go back to real life, or I don't want to go back to the real world, I don't want to go back to school, I don't want to go back home, that that statement will come out. And it's because in that moment, at that place, at that conference, we can fully feel the presence of God. We can feel the weight of it on our chest. We know God is there with us. And I think as Christians, we have that same thing happen to us on Sunday mornings. That while we are in this building, while we are in this place, and we are singing praise and worship songs to Jesus, and, and while we are hearing this message, we can feel the presence of God. We know that God is with us. But come Monday, we got to go back to the real world, right? Because come Monday, the stresses and the troubles and trials of work and of life and of housework and just of stress and anxiety, those are all going to come back, right? You see, at Winter Conference, God is all we talk about. He's all we sing about. He's all we think about. God is our focus, so it's so easy to feel God when he is your focus. Here at church, he is all we think about, talk about, sing about. He is our focus. But as soon as we get back to real life, as soon as we get back to work, as soon as we get back home, as soon as that first problem arises, as soon as our first pain kicks back in, God loses our focus. That we are no longer focused on God. We are now focused on our problem. And we cannot see God when we are only focused on our problem. You see, but the whole time, God is still as present as he was with you at church. Guys, he is still as present as he was with you at Winter Conference. He never stepped away. He never moved. He never walked away. He's still sitting there going, child, I haven't left you. Quit trying to fight that battle. Quit trying to face that trial. Quit trying to handle that situation all on your own. Quit trying to live a life without me because you are made to be a communal being. You are made to be in my presence. You are made to walk side by side in life with me. And when we face life 
alone, we will feel empty and we will always fall short. But I will say that this brilliant man we're reading about today, the Apostle Paul, he gives us some brilliant instructions in one of my favorite passages of the entire Bible. That when you are facing a difficult situation, when you are facing a trying time, when you are beaten, overwhelmed, and defeated, he gives us some brilliant instruction here. Sorry, I missed my main point. I got too into that. So I want us to know this, that who will openly admit that through this series, through this series, it's all good, your life hasn't been all good. Will I have anyone admit that with me? Because I've faced some things through this series and through this thought that it's all good that have not been good. And I've faced some times in my life where I questioned the goodness that was supposed to be there, that I faced some things that took away from it. But I, I learned something from something Pastor Dennis said a couple weeks ago, and it, just, it was a revelation in my brain. Pastor Dennis said that he used to be worried about his sons until he realized that God loved his sons more than he did. And in that moment, I realized that family member that I'm worried about, that struggle that I'm facing, that financial situation, that problem I am having, that struggle I'm going through, that God is there in the midst with me and he cares about it more than I do. That God is looking at your trouble, God is looking at your struggle and he cares about it more than you do. That when you are weeping, he is weeping beside you. And when you are struggling, he's struggling with you and he says, child, you were never meant to face that alone. And I realized this week the answer to that statement. I realized the only way that that statement can be true. It's this. The statement is conditional. Because it's not always going to be good. However, it is all good when it is all God. It's all good when you give it all to God. And when you give it all to God, it's all good. I want you guys to say it with me. It's all good. Say when it's all God. And when it's all God, one more time. It's all good. And when it's all God, when it's all God, absolutely, because when we take our troubles and when we take our struggles and we take the battles we are facing and we let God have control of those things, he will make it good. God says he will make all things, make sure you caught that, all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the troubles, the trials, the struggles, the problems you face, he will make them all good for those who love him. When we give it to God, he will make all things good. The statement's conditional, but it's all good when we give it all to God. Now, there are going to be points in our life where we face some things that we know that we cannot handle. And Paul gives us some phenomenal instruction for those points in our life. Paul says this in his letter to the church in Corinth. He says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. Have you ever felt that way? Crushed and overwhelmed beyond your ability to endure, that this thing that life is throwing at you, this circumstance the enemy has presented you, it is beyond your ability to endure it? Well, Paul says, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead, and he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. 
want you to notice that Paul, this man who met Jesus face to face and had his life completely altered and completely changed, that even this man faced troubles beyond his ability to endure. Even Paul was crushed and overwhelmed. He had circumstances in his life that he could not face himself. He was not strong enough. He had given up. He said, in those moments, the only thing we can do is rely on God. In that trouble, in that trial, when you've taken more than you can handle and you can no longer go on and you are in the midst of what seems like a hopeless situation, I have great news. There's not a single miracle in this book that doesn't take place from anything but a hopeless situation. God does his best works in seemingly hopeless situations. That when you think you've lost control and when you think you've been defeated and you think you can't go on, that's okay because you were never meant to handle it yourself. That you were meant to rely on God. That is the God we serve. The God who is always present. He's always with you. He is the key ingredient in life that if you miss the other five ingredients in life, if you only have God, your recipe will be fulfilled. However, if you have everything else but you lack the love of God, you have nothing. That a man who owns nothing can die a rich man with the love of God, but a man who owns everything can die a poor man without the love of God. Jesus is all you need. In every situation, in every circumstance, in everything you face, Jesus is the answer. That he wants you to rely on him and he's just as present Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday as he is here with you on Sunday. He has never left your side. And when you feel like you can't go on, he can go on for you if you simply rely on him. How different would that circumstance be? How different would your life be if you would simply give God the things that you cannot handle that when it is above your pay grade, you'd give it to the one who has the answers? How different would your life be if you would rely on God? Again, that's what I feel like God is saying to me this week and I'm hoping it's speaking to you. I just want you to know that whatever you face, whatever you go through, regardless of if the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years on earth is absolutely terrible. If you rely on God, he is just and he is graceful to get you through it. And that when you reach the other side of heaven, you will see his hand in every circumstance of your life. When you get to the other side, you will see that it is all good. That the trials and struggles of this life were temporary so that you could have an eternal home in his presence. That when you have nothing left in this life that you can cling to, when maybe your life does look like Job or that area of your life looks like Paul, that you have faith that you can cling to. You have the love of a sacrificial God who loved you so much he gave up his perfect life for you that you can cling to. You have the blood of Jesus that you can cling to. You have the resurrection power that you can cling to. You have a God that loves you so much that he paid the ultimate price. That is the hope you have. If it seems like you have nothing left on this earth, you have Jesus Christ you can cling to. So even when it doesn't seem like it, it's still all good. Because it's all good when it's all God, and when it's all God, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for this day, God. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your love, God. I thank you that even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our hopeless situations, God, you are not done, you are not through, that you will be victorious, God, that you are all we need. God, I just pray that we go out on Monday and we go out on Tuesday and we go and face the problems in life focused on you, God, watching for you, Lord, seeing what you're doing, watching for your hand in our lives, that when we feel broken and we feel empty and we feel defeated, God, you are not done. You still have your hand on our lives. You still have your hand on us, God. I thank you so much. 
for everything you do for us, you do through us. God, I pray that you're with each and every one of us, that you would let us feel your hand, your guidance, and your confidence in our lives, God. We thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.